bird on a tree. I'm just saying... Well, hello everyone. Happy Friday to you. Hope you're wearing a red shirt today for Red Friday. Remember everyone deployed. Uh, our way of saying thank you to the men in uniform in the military and, and the first responders that are helping us through this rather tough time in our lives. So uh, wear red as a thank you to everyone deployed. All right, are you ready for story time? Today we continue the second half of chapter two. So this is chapter 2B of Land Rovers. And we pick up in the hotel in Ellis Springs. The first job in the morning was to call at the government offices and make our pay claims. This was a curious Australian government comedy that I never fully understood in all the time I was working for the mapping authorities. All civil servants the world over have to get used to filling out forms for almost everything. But the pay claims in the mapping service were hideously complicated. On top of a basic wage of about 18 Australian pounds per week, I usually worked several hours of overtime that I had to account for. There were various different allocations for staying in hotels or camping at the roadside. On top of this, we were given an allowance for the flying time we did. Frowning, chewing the nub of his pen, Dave said gloomily, We need an accountant on this trip. A little man with a bowler hat and a briefcase sitting in the back seat all the way. Blowed if I can keep track of everything. I always come out the loser. We were joined for our northbound mapping expedition by a third man, Joe. So we drove through Ellis Springs to the airfield to meet him. The Ellis in daylight was a remarkable place. Lift a town of bungalows and gardens, then set it down in the middle of a dusty barren plain, and you have it. There are about 3,000 inhabitants, but it's also a market town for the biggest area in the world. At the main road intersection in the center of town, a group of loafers lounged in the hot sun. Stockmen, Dave exclaimed. They come here to spend their pay and pick up new jobs. The cockies look them over and sign them on. Cockies? Owners of the cattle stations. Some of the biggest stations are 600 miles or more away from here with nothing between except giddy bushes and half a dozen kangaroos. It's a big thing for them to come up to the Ellis Springs. They take back clothes, tin food, household gear, and all the rest of it, a supply that'll last them for months. After they get back, their only contact is through the Flying Doctor radio. I knew about that already. I had heard the exchanges between the base and dozens of outlying stations. Tell him Tim Hannery's wife had a baby boy. How big? Seven and a half pounds. Oh, and tell him the new back axle he ordered is here. Hello, Mary Thompson. About young Billy. Doctor says you're to keep him in bed and take his temperature every four hours. If it gets any higher, call us up. Joe arrived on a commercial airline from Melbourne. The next job was taking all the camera gear we would use in our mapping work over to Keladon Airways, the privately owned company operating in the Northwest Territory. We had chartered a small Cessna 150. We left Joe beside it, ringed with cameras and equipment, and drove back into town to reload the Land Rover. On the seat was a map of the Northern Territory. I had been studying it, trying to, <coughs> trying to wrap my tongue around the sounds of such strange names as Yuen Dum Dumu. Narwitoma, Kulaba, and Willaroo. It was impossible not to feel excited at the prospect of going out across a desert as huge as the one which lay ahead. Where exactly is it we're heading for, Dave? He pointed to the northwest corner of the map. Victoria River Downs. It's about 750 miles. Because there's no direct road, we have to go north and then branch away to the west. The plane will follow us in two days' time. Now, here's the stores list. I put a cross besides everything we haven't got. So I'll leave it to you to drive over and collect it all while, I'll, while I settle up at the hotel. 
Perhaps it was overexcitement that made me drive up to the curb outside the shop with such enthusiasm that I carried away the sun awning which hung out over the road. With the shop's owner's comments still ringing in my ears, I was glad when we drove off to the north. <clears throat> Dave traveled for some miles in silence, working at a bundle of papers on his knee. Then said thoughtfully, It's an ill wind that blows nobody any good. Huh? This road, it's tarred all the way up to Darwin, nice hundred miles of it. The Americans built it during the war when the Japanese were threatening an invasion. I didn't realize they came as close as that to attacking Australia. Chum, they really gave Darwin the jitters. Japanese bombers had a go at the ships in Darwin Harbor and sank several of them. It was a risky business bringing troops and munitions round to Darwin by sea, and the rail link has never been completed. <clears throat> so they couldn't send them up direct from Adelaide. The only answer was to use the railway up to Ellis Springs and improve the road the rest of the way. We're still getting the benefit. Dave slowed up. Your turn at the wheel, Robin. I was staring at a large rock formation that rose out of the desert. That's the Devil's Marbles. It was a good name. The enormous round red stones were balanced one on top of the other, as though a giant infant had been playing a game with building blocks weighing hundreds of tons. In the middle of such a vast desert, it was an eerie sight. The rumble of the Land Rover on the narrow ribbon of roughly tarred road was small comfort here where everything was made by giants. It was easy to let one's imagination go a little too far. That same giant who had balanced the marbles had coughed, making the all-night sandstorm. He had lain down to rest for a night of a thousand years. When he rose, left nothing but desert in the thousands of square miles flattened and made barren by the pressure of his body. Tennant Creek, the first town along the northbound road, was also the first place in Australia I heartily disliked. We pulled up outside the hotel. The people there and in the shops seemed surly and unwilling to help, as if strangers were unwelcome. The town had sprung up around a group of opal and gold mines. There is no water. Every drop is grimly rationed, for it has to be brought in by tanker trucks from a polluted borehole 12 miles away. In a land of perpetual dust, a chronic water shortage affects the whole character of the town. No welcome bath or shower meant sleeping with the thick coating of the day's grime still clinging to us, and our sweaty faces attracted more mosquitoes than usual. In the morning, after a night without much sleep in the airless hotel room, I mumbled blearily to Dave, I wish we'd camped instead. He nodded. So do I. We'll be camping most of the nights from now on. North of the Tennant Creek, we had a drive of about 160 miles to Newcastle Waters, where a track branched off to the west across the arid desert towards our destination. Victoria River Downs. That, said Dave, is where the fun begins. Remember the road up to the Ellis? Yes. That was a Queen's Highway compared to what we have ahead of us. The thought made me feel again that sensation of smallness in a huge unearthly country. I began to wonder too about Victoria River Downs. To anyone born in England, there was an inevitable mental picture, something like the Sussex Downs stretching to the banks of a river like the upper reaches of the Thames. And because of Victoria, an elderly dignified house surrounded by old mellow red brick farm buildings. Idiotically, though I had been long enough in Australia by now to expect nothing of the kind, I could not get this mental picture out of my mind. Dave was driving, so I opened up the map of the Northern Territory. The map, it was our job to bring up to date, and looked at the far northwest at the great empty wilderness in the middle of which was a pinpoint marked Victoria River Downs. What kind of people live there, remote as Lasha, hot as Arabia, 
How could anybody choose this place to build themselves a homestead? Yeah, I know, Dave suddenly said in a voice dry with dust. He must have been reading my mind. Like living on Mars, mind you, it isn't so bad now that they can get up to the Ellis by plane, or even by car. He patted the grimy dashboard of the Land Rover with affection. But think what it must have been like when all they had was horses. He pointed ahead of us. Here we are, Newcastle Waters, last cool drink for a long, long time. I thought this meant leaning on the counter of a store, surrounded by flour sacks and pickaxes. But instead, to my amazement, we halted at a hotel. In either direction, up or down the road, there was nothing. The hotel stood beside the Newcastle Waters homestead, as if some fierce desert wind had lifted it from a township, carried it hundreds of miles, then dropped it casually by the roadside, when it got tired of carrying the burden. How's trade? Dave asked the barman with a dry grin. All he got was a sour look. It wasn't until we had ordered again that the barman condescended to reply. He was an old man gnarled with that almost numb look that comes to people late in life when everything has gone wrong and they no longer have the energy to put up a fight or make it right. I own this hotel, he muttered. You don't know of anyone wanting to buy one. My old woman's sick and tired of the place. We don't reckon to see new faces often enough. Then, as if suddenly realizing he was talking away the value of the property, that's not to say a younger man couldn't liven it up a bit. We get cars come past, but they don't stop. You's bound for Darwin? Up to Victoria River Downs, he said Dave. The old man's eyes widened. That's a long, rough road. You'll need plenty of water. Vaguely, he added, baked like a biscuit they are. Who? Two in a car last year. Car broke down. See? Radiator went dry. Just like their bad luck, nobody else came along for a week or two. When they was found, they'd been baked dry. He drank deeply, making sure nothing of the kind would happen to him, then smacked his lips. That ain't the first time, neither. It ain't no proper road. Got good tires, have you? I nodded. The thing to remember is if you get a breakdown, don't leave the car. Dave was beckoning impatiently from the door. Thanks for the advice, I told the old man. We won't. Breakdowns were on my mind from that moment on. We swung off the tarred road onto a narrow track leading westward. It was bumpy and full of ruts made during the wet weather, when it had obviously needed the passage of only one or two cars or trucks to turn it into a sea of mud. Since then, months of sunshine had baked it as hard as rock. It was tropical sunshine, for we had crossed the Tropic of Capricorn just after leaving Ellis Springs. After six hours of jolting along at a slow speed, steering between the potholes, I began to understand the warning given by the old man at the hotel. In all that time, we had not seen another car, another human being, or any sign other than the existence of the track that human beings had ever ventured here. The potholes in the road were treacherous, but far more so were the dried-up creeks, with caked mud cracked like gigantic pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. The Land Rover would groan its way down into the bed of the creek. Then, in low gear, we would charge the other bank, bumping and lurching to the top, with the wheels spinning and throwing up clods of dust. Next time, Dave grunted, I think I'll ask the army for the loan of an old tank. What about one of those half-track weapon carriers? Dave sucked on the stem of his pipe. Trouble is, they're heavy on fuel. He slowed up alongside some curious lumps of rock, which stuck up six feet or more from the ground. Sun's going down, let's camp here for the night. I don't fancy driving along here after dark. When we had unrolled our sleeping bags and Dave was cooking steaks over a fire, I walked over to look at the rocks, which were only a few yards away. They were not rocks at all. Termite nests, Dave called out in explanation. It's too dark to see the little brutes. They're only about the size of a pinhead. 
The nests were like castles of earth, and unlike anthills, they rose up from the ground with sheer perpendicular faces. The impression of castles was strengthened by the jagged line of buttresses and castellations along the top. The main walls were baked hard by the sun, but the upper works were obviously the most recent additions, for they were still fragile and could be knocked down by a firm push. We sat beside the fire eating steak, conscious of the absolute silence all around us. Silence was something which as an Englishman I found hard to get used to, though we were hardly aware of it. Even in the most remote places at home, there was always some kind of noise, if no more than the distant calling of birds or the rustle of the wind in the trees. In fact, the first creature I had seen in many hundreds of miles put in an appearance just after daybreak the following morning. It was a handsome, gray, long-legged bird with a red top to its head and a long bill. Lying still in my sleeping bag, I watched it make a stately promenade two or three times past the blackened embers of our fire, and then, seeing no sign of movement, venture closer in search of food. I glanced across at Dave's sleeping bag, and saw that he, too, was watching our long-legged friend foraging for a breakfast. It stayed there several minutes, picking at an empty can of beans, then took flight and scuttled away across the desert. What was it? A companion bird. You don't often see them. Notice the way he held his head up? I reckon they're too stuck up to mix with ordinary people. After repacking, we spent a half hour at target practice with our rifles, before starting the day's journey. Partly this is because we were both reluctant to begin the monotony of the drive until we had to, but even more than this, we were anxious to be in good form for any game shooting to be had at Victoria River Downs. And we'll stop there. So that's uh, Chapter 2, Part B. Next Friday we'll have Chapter 2, Part C. It's a long chapter, <laughs> kind of like a giant chapter, just like the giant outback of Australia. Alrighty. Maybe you might want to take a drink of water to wash down the dust and soothe your parched throat before we have the groaner. You ready? Here it is. Out on the prairies, in an area known for tornadoes, a tornado ripped through a farm, tore the roof off the house, and sucked the bed right out of the master bedroom with the farmer and his wife still in it. Luckily, they were unhurt, and the cyclone or the tornado finally set them down in a field in the next county. Well, of course, they were clinging to each other in fear, but once the bed settled on the ground and the tornado moved off, the wife burst into tears, crying. The old farmer put his arm around her and said, Sweetheart, don't cry, we're safe, we're, we're not even hurt, and we can rebuild the farmhouse. And she said, You old fool, I'm not crying because the house is wrecked. I'm not crying because the tornado pulled us out of our home. I'm crying because this is the first time in 14 years we've been out together. <laughs> well, there you go. Hope you've enjoyed today's chapter. And tune in uh, Tuesday when we have some fun in the kitchen. Until then, have a great weekend. Take care, stay safe, and God bless. <laughs>